One of the many things I love about biblical Judaism is the way that the liturgical calendar just kind of carries us like a current or a tide, carries us into some of the most profound spiritual disciplines and exercises. Think about it, we have finished the month of Elul, the entire month basically being given over to introspection and contrition, the, the shofar being blasted every morning except Shabbat, uh, a blast to awaken us to the need to return to our God. Elul leads us right to the first of Tishri, to Yom Teruah, to Rosh Hashanah, a day of blasting of trumpets. The trumpet itself, the shofar, being a symbol of repentance. It's, it's broken, bent shape, uh, reminding us of what the scripture says, that God doesn't desire sacrifice. He desires a, a broken and a contrite, a malleable heart. And then, of course, Rosh Hashanah triggers the 10 days of awe, awesome days. Again, days of introspection, days of repentance, um, all culminating in Yom Kippur. There's Shabbat Shuvah. There is the Sabbath of return to Shuvah between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Uh, a day which is entirely given over to the matter of repentance. And then finally, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when the Jewish world corporately gathers as worshipers, those who believe in God, and ask of God what only he can give us, atonement, the forgiveness of sins. In other words, if this high holy day season is about anything, it is about repentance. But I have to wonder, looking at my own past as a Jewish man, not really understanding what repentance is, do we know what it is biblically? It's interesting to look at it from both the Hebrew and the Greek scriptures. Uh, biblical Hebrew has several words referring to the act of repentance. And some of these Hebrew words actually stem from a single root word that is really interesting. It's like a two-sided coin. One side speaks of sorrow and regret, and the other side speaks of comfort and consolation. Sorrow, consolation. Both coming from the same word. For example, Job the sufferer says, Nechamti, I abhor myself with dust and with ashes. That's an ancient Mideastern exercise in repentance, dust and ashes. Nechamti, he says, beckoning this root word that on one side makes reference to tremendous sorrow and regret. This term speaks of the sorrow and the, the self-loathing that inspires repentance. But there's another side to the same root word which speaks of not sorrow and regret, but of comfort and consolation. Now, God speaks through the prophet Isaiah saying, not nechamti, but nachamu, nachamu ami, comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Not sorrow, but comfort. And you find the very same root word in Nehemiah's Hebrew name, nechemia, meaning the comfort or consolation of God. So in other words, <laughs> from the very same Hebrew root word, we find two seemingly conflicting emotions, sorrow and comfort, but they're not conflicting at all. What this is, is heaven's little hint that true repentance involves both sorrow and comfort. There's another Hebrew word associated with repentance. It's called shuv or lashuv. It pictures someone literally physically stopping, turning, and going in the opposite direction. Now, the Greek scriptures add an entirely new dimension to the understanding of repentance. Remember, the Hebrew scriptures focus on the emotional and the physical aspects, comfort, sorrow, um, stopping, turning. But the Greek scriptures actually focus on the intellectual aspects of repentance. The Greek describes how the, the act of repentance actually plays on the intellect to produce a change of mind. The Greek word for repentance makes reference to a change of mind. The Hebrew describes how repentance affects our feelings and our actions. We feel sorrowful, we stop, we change direction, and finally we are comforted. So if we cut and paste all these biblical pieces together, we get a really whole and wholesome sense of God's definition of repentance. It's actually a chain of events. Repentance is a deep sorrow that leads to a resolute change of mind, a firm decision to stop 
and change direction, and the ultimate result is comfort. Sorrow, stop, turn, comfort. Sorrow, stop, turn, comfort. I'm shopping at the grocery store. I walk toward the checkout to buy a copy of one of those cheesy, horrible gossip magazines. I see the headlines. The headline says, Elvis' ghost speaks through Martian baby and tells secrets of Kanye's love life to Kim Kardashian while swimming with Meghan Markle's ex-boyfriend in Oprah's $5 million swimming pool. Yes, that is an actual headline that I just made up. Now, here's repentance. Four steps. Sorrow, stop, turn, comfort. Sorrow, stop, turn, comfort. First step, sorrow. I see the headline and, I, and I'm filled with sorrow. Sorrow over the fact that something in me actually desires this, this garbage. Yeshua said that blessed people mourn over sin. He's basically saying that one of the characteristics of a child of God, someone who's, who's alive and well in the kingdom of God, is she or he mourns over sin. Blessed are those who mourn. Sorrow is a good thing when it leads to repentance. Uh, James chapter 4 in the Brichadash on the New Testament says, quote, Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom, and he will lift you up. You see, true repentance starts with sorrow, with lamentations, with mourning, but it doesn't end there. Step two is stop. You stop. You, you change your mind. Okay, that's it. I will never buy this gossipy garbage ever again. Now, that's good, okay? But an earnest change of mind doesn't end there. It leads to action. Step three, turn. I'm moving away. I'm turning. I've changed direction. I'm walking away from the thing that was feeding my flesh towards something that is feeding my spirit. I am turning from something the world values and esteems to something that my God values and esteems. Which brings us to the very best part, step four. I am comforted. Now this is critical. Don't diminish its importance. If you're not comforted by your action, you probably haven't experienced true repentance. All right, you may feel the sorrow, step one. You may change your mind, step two. Okay, you may stop and turn, step three. But if Nehemia, if the comfort of God is not the end result, then you haven't received all that God has for you in repentance. You may have turned in the wrong direction. Now, I'm going to camp on that for just a moment because it's kind of a big deal. See, Religion, and when I speak of religion in this sense, I'm talking about all the man-made systems, all the man-made strategies for trying to, to be reconciled with God, for trying to be better people, for trying to overcome the problem of sin, mostly through behavior modification or through some series of performances. Human religion has done a great job of teaching repentance as a normal part of life, except for one fatal error. It has failed to tell us where to turn. And for not understanding where to turn, we have not understood true repentance and never experienced the comfort that comes of it. I mean, let's face it, you know this. Repentance has gotten a very bad reputation because religious folks basically have told us that it means giving up fun stuff. Okay, that doesn't lead to comfort. That leads to regret and resentment, not comfort. Again, the problem is, Religion hasn't taught us where to turn. Let me give you some examples from the Jewish world. This is Arthur Hertzberg. He's a very prominent lecturer on Judaism. Dr. Hertzberg said this, God as a father chastens his children to remind them of their proper dignity and character. That's good. He goes on, Repentance is therefore in Hebrew teshuvah, meaning returning, man's turning back to his truest nature. What? Turning back to your truest nature? I mean, the Bible says that man's truest nature is corrupt. It is, it is perverse. Jeremiah in chapter 17, verse 9 says that the, the heart, the, the truest nature of humanity is desperately wicked, so wicked we can't even understand it. 
return to our truest nature? Elsewhere in the scriptures, in the Bible, it talks about a dog returning to its vomit and a pig returning to its wallowing. What it's making reference to here is that you can teach a dog some tricks, you can dress up a pig, but eventually it'll always turn back to its truest nature. A dog will always return to its vomit, disgusting, and a pig to its wallowing. Return to your truest nature? No. To return to my truest nature would be like a prisoner being released from prison and then rushing to get back into prison. It makes no sense at all. Here's another example of this problem of, of turning in the wrong direction. Rabbi Harold White of Georgetown University in Washington, quote, It is the capacity of every human being to engage in teshuvah, to turn not to the hidden face of God, but rather to the God that dwells within. Friends, if that is the supreme purpose of repentance, not to return or turn to our sovereign creator, but rather to turn within to our truest nature, which the Torah says is twisted and defiled because of sin, and if we are to turn to the God that dwells within, which the Bible says is the root of all idolatry, friends, if we can only turn within, not only will we not find comfort, we will not find salvation. We will not find forgiveness of sins, which is what this Yom Kippur is all about. Listen to the Jewish voices which truly spoke for God. These are the Hebrew prophets. Isaiah in chapter 31. Return to him, the Almighty, against whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. Isaiah chapter 44, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. He says, return to me, for I have redeemed you. Jeremiah chapters 3 and chapter 4, return you backsliding children, return to me, for I have redeemed you. You shall not be moved. Let the wicked man forsake his way. Listen, in other words, the way he follows naturally. No, walk away from that. Not only are we not to return to our truest nature, we are to forsake it, the scripture says. And the prophet goes on, he says, Let the wicked man forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, for he, the Lord, will have mercy on him. Do you see the high cost of this error? The error of practicing repentance that actually turns to our truest nature, or the so-called God within. It's like that poor Schlemiel American football player who trained all summer. This is actually a true story. Trained all summer, learned all the plays, dis disciplined himself, stayed in shape. The big game arrives. He, he, uh, he gets on the field, catches his first reception, reception of the season, turns to Shuva, and amazingly runs the entire length of the field and scores a touchdown for the wrong team. <laughs> he did everything right except for one fatal error. He turned and ran in the wrong direction. It breaks my heart that so many of my Jewish people have been training for so long, learning the plays for so many centuries, working out, preparing for repentance, doing everything right except for that one fatal error. Every year, when the High Holy Day season begins, that season of repentance and return. So many Jewish people turn within and run the wrong way. Score one more for the enemy. The Hebrew prophet was sickeningly accurate when he said these words, quote, For lack of knowledge, my people Israel perish. The rabbi and apostle Paul said, They, Israel, have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So speaking of knowledge, let's just rehearse what we know so far. We know that repentance from God's perspective involves four steps, if you will. Forgive me for equationizing, but you see this in the scripture. Sorrow, decision, turn, comfort. Sorrow, stop, turn, comfort. Now, if repentance turns sorrow into comfort, Tell me, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? It's a good thing. It's a gift. It's not a religious man's duty. It's a righteous man's reward. 
I mean, most of us, when we hear the word repent, be honest. Don't you think of the guy on the street corner, you know, with the black suit and the black tie and the big black Bible and the big black furrowed brows, and he's mad, you know? Repent, sinner! He's yelling at everybody who's going by, telling them to repent. You may remember the, the guy in uh, California years ago, if you're, some of you were old enough to remember, Holy Harold. Holy Harold was that guy. He stood on busy street corners, black suit, black Bible, screaming at passersby. Holy Harold did not get a lot of bar mitzvah and wedding invitations <laughs> because he was representing something that was odious, something that was disgusting to the world around him. This is not repentance. Repentance is not bad. It's good. Listen, it turns sorrow into comfort. Good grief, we take drugs for those kinds of results. <laughs> we eat comfort food, you know, potato chips and ice cream for those kinds of results. And here, God is giving it away for nothing. It's a gift. And not only that, unlike comfort food, it's healthy for you. And still, some of us, we're just not getting it, that it's good. Or at best, we think of it kind of like, you know, when someone hands us a breath mint. Have you ever had that happen? You know, okay, I might need it. It might be good in that sense, but uh, I didn't like the experience. Sometimes we think of repentance in the same way. All right, so here is a litmus test. Here is a surefire way to tell whether or not you understand repentance as God meant it to be understood. Here it is, very simply. If repentance is distasteful to you, I promise you, you're not getting it. If repentance to you is the spiritual equivalent of, of taking a tablespoon of cod liver oil, ugh, then you're not catching it. And to help you catch it, I'm going to take you back to a passage to which I alluded a little bit earlier. It's from Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, and I'm reading verses 6 through 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Listen. Let him return, shuv, to the Lord. And he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Now, don't get hung up on the words wicked or unrighteous. You know, I'm not wicked. How dare you presume I'm... Calm down. <laughs> it's not a big deal. The word wicked simply means wrong, and the word unrighteous simply means not right. Okay? So if you can do this subtly, I want you to look around where you are right now. You're going to notice somewhere someone right in your vicinity who has on occasion been wrong, yes, even morally wrong, and that person is sitting in your seat. Sorry, welcome to Yom Kippur. Let the wrong person forsake his way, God says in Isaiah chapter 55. Now the word forsake just means let go of, let go of, and, and this is a king-size clue why some folks find it so hard to repent. It's because there is stuff we just don't want to let go of. My two youngest boys, uh, Noah and Avi, uh, when they were little guys, each one of them had one end of a doomed plastic dinosaur. They were tugging on this dinosaur. Neither of them really wanted the dinosaur. They just wanted the other one not to have it, okay? <laughs> I mean, if you've ever wondered why di dinosaurs became extinct, come over to my place. So <laughs> these two boys, white knuckles, tears, and sweat. I, I had to finally pry their, their little blood-starved fingers from this poor dead dinosaur because they just refused to let go. Dear friends, you cannot repent without letting go. This is what makes it so scary for some of us. Be honest, because some of the stuff that we're clinging to is stuff that we think is attached to our identity or our personality or our passions. Let go. No, I can't do that. That would be like giving up a part of me. You know, in, 
in the late 70s, I started reading my Bible for the first time. And the more I read, the more evident it became that as distasteful and uncomfortable as it was, if I wanted to have a relationship with God, I was going to have to deal with the problem of my sin. And if I was going to deal with the problem of sin, I was going to have to do it God's way, which appeared to involve Jesus, and I really didn't like that as a Jewish young man. But I kept reading. And the more I read, trying, really trying to understand objectively, knowing my own prejudices, the more I read, the more obvious it became that God did exactly what he promised he would do. He neutralized the curse of sin and the power of sin by laying your sin and my sin upon the only sinless sacrifice, Yeshua. Did you hear that? God murdered sin and death by casting sin and death upon the only sinless human being the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And the more I read this Bible, the more clear it became that there were, there were ways and, and there were thoughts that I was just clinging to with white knuckle tenacity, like Avi and Noah were clinging. Clinging for, for fear of losing them. These ways and thoughts that were organically attached to my, my identity, my personality, my passions. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. Man, how I hated those words. And I clung tighter and tighter, all the while knowing that eventually I would either have to let go or continue living a lie, which I knew I couldn't do. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him shuv, repent, return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. Let him return to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Friends, did you hear it? Where do we turn? This is not rocket science. It is not complicated. We don't turn inward to our truest nature. We don't turn inward to the God within, which is nothing more than my self-centered passion to play Lord of my ring, running my life my way on my schedule. Where do we turn? We turn to the Lord. We turn to our God. And the promise is that he will have mercy and he will abundantly pardon. And there it is. <laughs> the promised result of repentance. Comfort. Comfort. Now let's just wrap it up. Repentance is not a singular event. It is a lifestyle. If you want to know the secret to victorious living, it is a lifestyle of repentance over and over and over again. I have sorrow. I make a decision to change. I turn. I walk toward the Lord, and I'm comforted by God's mercy and pardon. When? Once? No. Over and over and over again. I remember the day when God showed me how my sarcasm was wounding my wife. It's incredible that the, the, the person whom I claim to love more than any other human being on the planet, I was wounding again and again with sarcasm. God gave me a taste of his hatred for my sin. I had intense sorrow. That sorrow led me to make a firm, resolute decision to stop, to turn toward the Lord, and I found comfort. Friends, over and over again, the gift of repentance enables me, and can you, to let go of something you're holding on to, some, some plastic dinosaur that needs to become extinct in our lives. What are you holding on to? Uh, I've heard the story of a, of a mother who was walking her young daughter home from school, and as they passed a toy store window, the little girl looked in the window and saw a, a little plastic pearl necklace. She fell in love with the necklace. And she asked her mother to buy it for her. And the mother said, well, honey, I'll tell you what, if you do extra work at home, I'll pay you a nickel here, a dime there, a quarter here, and you can come back and buy it. Well, you can bet the little girl was intent on working overtime at home, so she did. And uh, went back and bought the necklace, and she loved it. It was her most prized possession. She wore it to sleep. She wore it to school. She wore it in the shower. She wore it when she ate. She loved that necklace. Well, one night, as her father was tucking her into bed, 
he did something very strange. He said to her, sweetheart, may I have your necklace? And the little girl was shocked and she said, well, well, daddy, I really love my necklace. I'll tell you what, take my teddy bear. He's a great toy. You'll love him. And the father said, no, honey, that's okay. And he kissed her, tucked her in, left the room. The second night it happened again. As he was leaving her, he stopped and said, sweetheart, may I have your necklace? The little girl began to cry and she said, well, daddy, it's my most precious toy. Please take all my other toys. Just let me have my necklace, please. And he said, sweetheart, that's okay. And kissed her and left the room. The third night she was prepared. Here, daddy, you can have the necklace. The father took the necklace and he put it on the bedside table, reached into his back pocket and pulled out a genuine, valuable pearl necklace for his little girl. Friends, there's a very good chance that some of us are missing out on a boatload of comfort just because we're clinging tightly to plastic counterfeit ways and thoughts that are not God's, they're ours. They're just cheap toys, you know, our darling little convictions and preferences which we're mistaking for life and identity and which are robbing us, robbing us of our inheritance of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's just time to let go. One last word about repentance. Friends, you can't return to the Lord if you haven't first turned to the Lord. The first step for every one of us who is sick and tired of, of me-centered living, aren't you sick of it, honestly? I mean, what fruit has come of it that's not plastic and hollow and dead? For every one of us, the first step is to turn. Now, it doesn't have to be dramatic. You know, just turn. And you might be asking, well, why do I have to do that? Why do I have to turn? Well, here's why. We have to turn because every one of us was born in a condition where our back was turned on God. And if you don't believe that, just listen to yourself, honestly. Just listen to how you fuss and fume every time you don't get your precious little way. Listen to how you, you declare that's not fair and how you, you strive for justice when it benefits you and you run from it when it doesn't. And by the way, you don't want justice. <laughs> justice is getting what you deserve. You don't want that. What you want is mercy. Mercy is, getting, is, is, is not getting what you deserve. And actually better than that, you want grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Forgiveness. Kippur. Atonement. Reconciliation with God. Fellowship with Him. That's what you get through repentance. Well, our natural condition is with our back turned toward the Lord. This is the condition we inherited from Adam. It, it is the condition we actually die to when we're born anew in the Messiah. And in this condition, this Adamic, this old, natural, twisted, perverted way, every step we take naturally is a step away from God and away from heaven. You know, I remember this, this uh, late afternoon when I was running on the beach, it was a beautiful day and the sun was actually setting behind me and I was running on the beach just having a little jog and I noticed as the more I ran, the longer my shadows were becoming in front of me. I was literally running into the darkness and the more I ran, the, the, the deeper the, the shadows became, the, the greater the darkness was that was consuming me. But I noticed something and it was kind of an epiphany. At any moment... At any moment, whether I had been running for a minute or an hour or a lifetime, all I had to do was turn and I would be instantly bathed in the beauty and the comfort of the sun. Friends, some of us have been running a long, long time toward the shadows. And the further we go, the longer and darker, you've noticed it, the longer and darker the shadows become. Each step taking us nearer to the end, nearer to the grave, nearer to an endless eternity, a darkness that never ends. 
For each and every one who is on this course, there is one essential action he or she must take. He must stop, change their mind, turn. And this is the amazing thing. The moment you turn, you will find yourself in the light, comforted without even a trace of darkness before you. That is the promise of God, and that is the reward of repentance.